I would ask for all the school kids that we have not prayed over previously, last week. Doesn't matter if you're what school district you're in or if you're homeschooled. I want you all to come forward. If And I hope you brought your backpacks. If you did, bring it with you. And I'm going to ask Hunter to come up and help me so that we can expedite this a little bit. All right, stretch out, kids. Form a line across here. Turn around and face me. Are you excited? No. <laughs> Are you excited? What excites you about school starting? Being in high school. I can remember that. I know you may laugh because I say that, but yeah, it's been a long time, but I can remember that. Are you excited? No, no. Cassidy, are you excited? Hmm? All right. Line up across here. We're going to anoint you and pray for the school year. Okay? Did we do you last week? Okay. Are we missing any kids? Okay. You anoint them, then I'll pray over them. All right? In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son. In the name of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son. In the name of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son. In the name of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me see the backpacks. I want to put a spot of oil on them. No backpacks? Oh, that's right. You don't have to, you don't have that far to walk, do you? <clears throat> Holy God, I thank you for each one of these young men and women regardless of age, regardless of grade in school. I lift them to you that as they walk the halls of their classes, of their school buildings, or from one room to the next at home, as they enter, act, and react with classmates and peers. Let the Spirit of Christ, Lord, remain in them and exude from them. Let their peers ask that question, what's different about you? Let their teachers ask, what's different about you? And they can be quick to say, I have the Spirit of Jesus Christ living within me. Let it exude through their smile, through their eyes, through their facial expressions, through their actions, and especially their reactions. Because through them, Lord, you can enter into that school building. And I bind and rebuke Satan as he might try to attack any one of them. And even those that we prayed for last week. If he attacks them physically with health issues, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bind and rebuke it. If he attacks them with bullying, I bind and rebuke that student or person that is trying to bully. Let 
you, Lord Jesus, remain dominant in all things as they persevere in their lives. May they give you all the glory. In your precious name, Lord. Amen. Thanks, guys and gals. Now we're going to ask the big kids if they're a teacher, if they're staff support, don't put it up yet. If they're a school board member, I want y'all up here. It's your turn. See, I get to pray with them twice. Some of them I got to pray with this last week. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son. In the Holy Spirit. In the Father. In the Son. In the Holy Spirit. In the Father. In the Son. In the Holy Spirit. Gracious and loving God, I thank you for each one of these. School board members, librarians, school nurse, teachers. Even those that teach at home. We lift them all to you, O oh God. As you pour your spirit upon them, I bind and rebuke Satan as he would attack in any form or fashion, physically, spiritually, emotionally. As they sit through the school board meetings, give them clarity of mind and wisdom and discernment. As they interact with the kids in the classrooms, in the halls, in the cafeteria, in the nurse's office. Give them that same wisdom and discernment as they interact with the students one-on-one. -on -one. May that wisdom and discernment go far beyond just the obvious facial expressions or eye expressions or words spoken. that they have that keenness of hearing to hear with the eyes as well as the ears. For many times, we don't know what's going on outside of school in that child's life. Yet you do. Let them glean from that student Give them the words to speak at the right moment as they be attuned to you, to your voice. Use them, O oh God. May the students see Christ in them, in their faces, in their eyes, in their actions and reactions. May their peers see that as well. And may they come and say, what is it that you have? For I want it. And may they be able to say openly and boldly, I have Jesus Christ in my heart. And let that person say, how do I find Jesus Christ? Let them discreetly introduce them to Christ. Or if that individual knows Christ and said, I want more of Him, let them share their faith. 
for that's how we get you back into the schools, Lord Jesus. It's not to go protest before the school board or before the principal's office or outside the buildings. It's to walk in silently, quietly, shining the light of Christ so that others may see it. Bless them with excellent health, clarity of voice, sound mind. Using it all, Lord, to your glory as they mentor, instruct, as they glean from one another. All this we ask and we pray in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. And all God's children said, Amen. Thank you all. If, if we missed one of you, please let me know because you deserve that gift as well. And that's what it is. It's a gift. It's a gift that can lead to Olympic faith. How many of you watch the Olympics? Probably all of us. Kind of a dumb question, isn't it? Well, preachers ask dumb questions too. A few weeks ago, the International Olympic Committee met to consider host sites for future Olympic Games. I don't know whether y'all paid attention to that or not. I didn't read all the stories in depth, but I noticed noticed it. Noticed Los Angeles, I believe, was in contention for one of the sites. And and what's interesting about this connection to our faith is that's really what Paul's going to be talking about in our scripture passage today is how we run the race the Olympic race of life we may not be in those Olympic games but we are running an Olympic race of life if you think about that and there's some qualities that are included in in all of this that the Olympics Promote. Here's some of the, the qualities, the core values, if you will. Number one is tolerance. And I honestly believe we are becoming a nation of intolerance, which saddens my heart. Another quality or core value is solidarity. Are we united? As one. A very key one is peace. Something the world truly needs today. And the obvious one that's, that's highlighted is friendship. Now there's one that's not on the list. In my, my opinion, this is preacher opinion. That and a dollar will get you a cup of coffee at some places. Not in New York City, but some places. And the one that I would add is faith. I would add faith because faith is what allows you and me in a well-conditioned body of Christ to run with perseverance the race that's set before us. Now think about that for just a moment. Would you include faith in that list? Before we explore it, let's pray. Lord, by Your Spirit, open our hearts and minds, our, our entire being to You and You alone. Let us lay aside anything that would distract us 
from hearing what you would speak to each of us this day. And again, Lord, I ask you to hide me behind you and behind your cross so that you receive all glory and honor. For it's in your precious name, Lord Jesus, that I pray. Amen. Our, our passage comes from the letter to the Hebrews, 11th chapter, starting at verse 29. How many of you have your Bibles? Now, I'm going to challenge you. I've been known to ask, do you have your Bible? If so, I want to see it. For many years, my Bible stayed on the shelf. Kind of like a lot of family Bibles. And all it does is draw dust. And in January 1990, God got a hold of me and I began carrying my Bible. I began using it. And Rhonda will tell you that any time I traveled on a business trip, the first thing I put in my suitcase, yeah, I packed myself. She won't. I won't let her. She might forget something important, but I pack, and the first thing in is, is a Bible. I've got one with me 24 7. Not just this one, there's one in the pickup. I've got one in my, on my cell phone. So I've always got God's holy word with me. But here's what the author of Hebrews writes. Starting at verse 29. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who came powerful in battle and routed foreign armies, when women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while others still were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we see that we've got a great cloud of witnesses. The Olympians have a great cloud of witnesses as well. If you think about that, all the spectators, 
all of those other athletes, all of those who have participated in Olympic Games prior years, are that great cloud of witnesses. Encouraging them. Cheering them on. Giving witness. We have a great cloud of witnesses. We may not see them, but they're there. They're cheering us on, encouraging us. Encouraging us to persevere in our individual Olympic race. No, it it may not be in the stadium with the Olympiad. But nevertheless, we're in a race. Life is like a race. Now we could suspend the games like they did for 1,500 years from 336 A.D. until 1896, I believe it is, when they started up again in Athens in that marvelous Olympic stadium at the time, they endured. I've, I've watched those athletes through the years as they persevere through all the struggles, watching those ice skaters as they train hour after hour after hour. Runners, running every day, training. You see, that Olympic village becomes a community. And what is unique about that community is they don't care what country you come from. They don't care what sport you're entered into. You're an athlete and you're part of the community. Yeah, they march in on that opening night carrying their flags from each country and all of them grouped around that flag. But once that ceremony is over, it's community. The church is like that. Doesn't matter where we come from. Doesn't matter what our occupation is or what age we are. How much hair we have or don't have. How we dress doesn't matter. What matters is we're a community. Encouraged by that community that has gone on before us. That great cloud of witnesses that the author talks about. Encouraging us on to run the race with perseverance. To live into all of those characteristics and traits that the Olympics promotes. Not just at the beginning of the games, Throughout the entire two weeks or two months, it seemed like it's two years at times. But it's there. To encourage one another on. To lift one another up when life wants to push us down. To help us rise up to the challenge. And yeah, sometimes we come away feeling defeated. But that great cloud of witnesses is there to encourage us and say, don't quit, keep trying. Don't quit, keep trying. Draw strength from one another. Be each other's cheerleader. That's what Olympic faith is all about. 
It's encouraging one another. It's lifting one another up. Strengthening one another. When we we have a gift that someone else doesn't have, it takes both of us. Because not everybody has the same gift. It takes us on. It takes us on to be cheerleaders for one another. It takes us on to lift up, to overcome, not beat down. As I was thinking about this, the first protest probably was marching around Jericho. Seven days they marched. I'm so thankful these protests don't last seven days. I don't think we could handle it. But if if we want to protest, there's a right way to do it. And you do it with Olympic faith. You do it silently. You do it in prayer. Praying for one another. We do it as a community. We do it as that great cloud of witnesses. We can go back to the roots of the Olympiad. And we can glean all that we can glean because they have the model. They understood what it means to be community. In his book, The Millennium Matrix, Rex Miller has focused on that key aspect, community. As one of the key characteristics of the living church in the years to come. Looking at contemporary culture, he notices that there is an intoxicating mix of fellowship, celebration, and enterprise. And you're not going to believe the groups that he looked at, that he gleaned all of this. The first one that he mentions in his book is Harley Davidson Gatherings. Folk art festivals. Grateful Dead concerts. Mac World. Now this, this next one I really like. Bill Gaither concerts. Now I can handle that. Even Mary Kay and Amway conventions. I've never been to either one of those. Probably won't ever go either. I might like to go to a Harley Davidson gathering. But he noticed that those groups, those gatherings, consistently grew year after year. And they've been unusually effective because of the synergy of interaction and fellowship. You see, that's what makes the Olympics so great. It's the interaction and the fellowship. Yeah, we interact when we come to worship. Well, somewhat. Hopefully we're interacting with the Lord when we come to worship. And we interact in our discipleship groups. And we can always use more folks in the groups. Did I hear an amen faintly in the back? Somebody's got laryngitis back there. Think about it, folks. Why are the churches not growing in this way? Because it's we become agenda driven and focused on Sunday events. We 
we see community as the byproduct of our gatherings. Not the reason for our gatherings. If we want to grow, if we want to persevere as the body of Christ, we've got to get serious about our relationship with Christ. We've got to get serious about our faith. And we've got to get serious about our interactions as a community with one another. Not just on Sunday. I grew up in the era of blue laws. Now, for you younger folks that don't know what that is, there are certain items we could not, when I worked in the grocery business, there were certain items we could not sell on Sundays. Floral shops, car dealers. About the only thing that was open on Sundays was the restaurants. Except in California. They operate seven days a week. Doesn't matter what your business is about. There's a lot to learn from running the race of life with mediocre faith and having Olympic faith. And if we want to be the body of Christ that we are called and charged to be, then we got to learn from the Olympic communities. We got to develop our faith, not just use it on Sunday mornings, not just use it when we pray over a meal. You got to exercise it. You got to work at it like an athlete. You got to develop it. And you got to run the race. Seeing the goal in sight. Paul tells us what the goal is, or not Paul, the author of Hebrews tells us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy... Now I struggle with this. I see no joy in enduring the cross, but He considered it pure joy who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I challenge you folks, we need Olympic faith. And we need to strive. We need to endure. We need to work Toward Olympic faith. We need to persevere. And I pray for perseverance for every one of you in your faith journey. May God meet you in the struggles, lifting you up. May the cloud of witnesses encourage you when life presses you down, when Satan wants to kick you while you're down and keep you down, turn to the author of life. Let him lift you up. 
let him strengthen and deepen your faith. In Jesus' name, amen.